Welcome. Everything is fine. You're listening to Fork and Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week we're talking about Season 3, Episode 7, A Fractured Inheritance, written by Cassia Miller, directed by Beth McCarthy Miller, and it aired November 1st, 2018. While the rest of the group remains in Budapest, Eleanor and Michael fly to Nevada to see Eleanor's mother, Donna. After learning Donna faked her death, Eleanor is ready to confront her. Michael tries to persuade Eleanor to stay on task by helping Donna get into the good place. All right, so obviously we knew this was coming, seeing as last episode Eleanor said she was going to murder her. <laughs> um, and it's fun, we get like a little moment of like, it's Diana Tremaine, that's her, her new name now, and of course that's a callback to Eleanor's alias, Diana Tremaine from Canada City, Canada. And I find, like, Donna's fake death, the explanation of being trampled at a Rascal Flats concert, is kind of like Eleanor's real death, in a way. I mean, being trampled by something. I guess sure. Eleanor really would have been just, like, hit by a truck, but... Trampled by shopping smushed. carts and... Yeah. Then a truck. Yeah. I mean, adjusting a tow ring, reaching for margarita mix, it's like potato tomato, yeah? Same thing. <laughs> Now, I guess she's hanging out in Tarantula Springs, which doesn't actually seem like an actual place. No, I can't imagine that's a real place in Nevada. Oh, I can't. A place crawling with tarantulas. Ugh, awful. Sounds disgusting. Sounds like Australia. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I guess. Last episode, you mentioned that you didn't feel like Eleanor's mother would be able to be redeemed because she's too far gone. So it was kind of interesting to see... To watch it all unfold based on what we said last week. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, yeah. It was it was interesting. Um, not altogether satisfying from my point of view, but interesting. Mm-hmm. So when Michael says, you know, I understand, like I get what you're feeling, but whatever you're feeling, remember this isn't about you. We're here to help Donna get into the good place, blah, blah, blah. Immediately, I was frustrated. Yeah, I totally disagree with that because their relationship is key to how it all unraveled. Yeah, exactly. Eleanor's mother is one of the reasons Eleanor is who she is now. Mm -hmm. She took after her mom in many ways. So it bothers me that Michael just says this isn't about you and we just need to put all of that aside. How can you do that when... It's literally affected your whole entire life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it's who you, it's a big part of who you are. And not only that, but Eleanor was just given this information that her mother isn't actually dead. Like yesterday? Give her a little time to, I don't know, have that information sink in maybe? A little time to process would be nice. And then in this moment too, when Michael is saying, we're going to try and help her get into the good place... I just feel exactly the same way I did last episode with Donkey Doug. Like, are they too far gone? Do their past misdeeds outweigh any good that they could do in the future? Like, I don't mean to imply that if you haven't been the best person, that you shouldn't try at all to improve and do better. It's just that by this show's logic, it seems like unless you were basically a saint, you're not going to the good place. Like... Could Donna do enough to become a good enough person to go to the good place when Chidi can't or couldn't? Well, the difference is they're given the opportunity to turn their lives around at the halfway point. So they've accumulated all these, you know, hundreds of thousands of negative points. Mm -hmm. But maybe, I mean, if they kept along the same path that they're going, then they would just keep racking up those negative points. But for Eleanor's mom's situation, it seems like... She's already been on the path to accumulating good points. That's true. So it's almost like they don't even need to intervene. Yeah, for for Eleanor's mom, it seems a little bit like they didn't need to. But what I mean to say is that I guess in the first, first episode, the pilot, we saw that video that Michael showed us and the point totals, and it was 
ridiculous. It was like points in the the hundreds of millions and the mm-hmm. billions that would get you into the good place. And I know that that was, you know, not the real good place. I understand that 100%. But as Michael has said before, and as Eleanor said before too, a good lie contains a bit of truth in there, right? right? And we already know that someone like Tahani and Chidi at the point of death were not able to go to the good place despite the good things that they had put out into the world. So right. I don't know. I'm skeptical, basically. I know. It just seems like such a big hole for them to be able to dig out of. Yeah. Unless they do some huge, giant gestures of goodness. Mm-hmm. Or if we find out that it's not actually that hard to yeah. get into the good place. That could be mm-hmm. part of the, the plot going forward. Finding out what the actual values are and what you actually, what the threshold is in order to make it through. Mm -hmm. I guess I just, I find it difficult to imagine that Michael would have this mission. It makes sense to me that Eleanor and Chidi and Tani and Jason would all want to help people be better. I get that. They're all on that path, regardless of the fact that they're doomed. I just have a harder time believing that Michael's pushing it so hard if it's not really a feasible thing. So that's kind of a bit of a disconnect for me this episode and the last episode too. I see Michael and Janet helping them more for themselves and the group rather than the end game. It gives them something to do with their friends. Um, Whether it's futile or not, it doesn't really matter. Okay. It's the gesture. It's like we were talking about last episode with, look, I know your idea is garbage and it's not going to go anywhere with your, you know, your spray. It, your double trouble. Your double yeah. trouble. But you really want to do it. So let's, I'll help you. Okay. So maybe it's that situation. Michael knows he doesn't want to tell them. He knows that it's not going to get them anywhere, but still wants to help them out. Okay. And maybe the effort is worth it in the end. Yeah. Maybe that's all that matters. I guess the effort is the worth intention. it only because doing good ripples out into the world. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'm being rigid. I get it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay. Eleanor confronts her mother, but they are quickly interrupted by Donna's boyfriend and his daughter. Donna pretends Eleanor is her sorority sister, and Eleanor finds out that Donna is running for secretary of the PTA. Meanwhile, in Budapest, Tahani and the others go to Camilla's museum exhibit so Tahani can make peace with her sister. So Dave looks a lot like Bill Gates, which I thought was really interesting. I feel like that's purposeful. Yeah? Yeah, like he's supposed to be that nerdy, successful guy that not a lot of women go for necessarily unless they know he's rich. Right. You know? That makes sense. (laughs) To make him a perfect mark. Yeah. And make Eleanor even more suspicious. Yeah, for sure. Because he's not, you know, Mr. Super Buff or sexy stretched out Alex Trebek, right? right. So <laughs> he looks kind of like a, a doof. Yeah, a lo- doofus. A little bit of a nerd. Yeah. Yeah. And he's kind of awful, but like in a really endearing way, I guess. When you see him come out and he's talking about... Uh, when you see him come out and he's talking about Marga Clock and he, that laugh, it's so infectious. And like he says all these things that are really borderline concerning, like not caring about having a knife in his face just because Donna is so beautiful and them making out on a broken toilet in an alley. Like those are not great things, you know? It was just so out of his ordinary <laughs> and out of his, you know, something that he would. Well, it's, yeah, I don't know, just cut that. You know, new and exciting, something you're totally out of character for you to go after or, you know, a type of person that you would stay a mile away from. Yeah. And probably someone you would want to stay a mile away from your daughter. Yeah. I don't know. I just think there's a little bit of, uh, I imagine, a little bit of Donna. In- I imagine it took him a while to introduce them. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. (laughs) I would hope so, at least. Oh, goodness. So I like that Eleanor immediately does exactly what Michael tells her not to do. Um, It's expected, but it's it's kind of cathartic in a way to get Eleanor, to get to see Eleanor get angry at her mom. Um, 
she's been holding a lot of that in, obviously. Mm-hmm. And I like here that she says, you will always be sun-baked Arizona trash. And I know that because I grew up baking right beside you. So it's interesting that like Eleanor noticed that she has personally changed. Like she understands that she's come a long way as a person, but it's just right in that sentence. It's like, I can't even imagine that you would have changed even a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. none of it. And it shows right there. Like I grew up baking right beside you. Like I was, you know, I was becoming the same person as you. So there's no way you changed. Yeah. A lot of this whole episode just seems like a lot of projection Mm -hmm. on Eleanor's part. Projection? Yeah. She's seeing herself and her mom. Like Eleanor keeps pushing the fact that her mom has not changed and she's still going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of Eleanor's fears is that she, no matter how much she tries and attempts to change, she's always just going to be trash. Oh. Okay. Yeah, like, you're sun-baked Arizona trash, blah, 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 and I'm exactly the same way, and that's how we are. We don't change. You keep trying to tell everybody you've changed and you're a better person now, but at the end of the day, you're still trash. Hmm. That's tough. That's the way I see it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. So in Budapest, Tahani basically has the same thing as Eleanor. She has Janet saying that she needs to make amends. Um, But I like the way she phrases it better. Not like, this isn't about you. We've got to focus on this. It's more, well, the feud that you had with your sister is what kept you out of the good place. And because the two of you are so alike, it's probably going to keep her out of it too. And despite the fact that you might kind of hate her, you probably don't want her to be doomed for all eternity, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. It just comes off as a little bit kinder. But at the same time, their insistence, both Janet and Michael's insistence, doesn't really sit right with me this episode just because... Neither of them have that experience of having a sister that's really competitive with you and who treats you like garbage publicly very often. And neither of them have an experience of having a mother who's neglectful and abusive. Like they don't, they don't have that. They can't possibly understand how it feels for Eleanor and Tani. So then I get a little frustrated when people tell others how they need to feel or Mm. how they need to behave when it comes to a situation that they're very unfamiliar with. This might all boil down to how the good place and the bad place works. And Michael's insistence is that it's not about you and not taking into consideration that they had such a horrible upbringing or mm-hmm. to Hani or Eleanor. Because it might not matter to him. Like, at the end of the day, in the good place or the bad place, those things might not matter. They might not take that into consideration, which is another example of the broken system. Mm. Like, they might not give a crap if you were abused as a kid and if you start abusing other people or if it affects your life negatively. Like, you're still going to get negative points. They're not going to give you any leeway. Mm. They're not going to, you know, pad the stats for you. So basically they won't acknowledge that anyone maybe has like sort of a more privileged upbringing right. based on like having, you know, caring parents, that kind of stuff versus mm-hmm. having, you know, parents that don't give a crap about you, all that. Right. Okay. So yeah. let's say a person walking down the street who's super poor and doesn't have a lot of money, but still donates, you know, half their lunch to a homeless person versus... A person who's really wealthy and has loads of money and has hundreds of sandwiches a day and donates half a sandwich to a homeless person. They both do the exact same thing. But maybe the person who's a little bit less well off should get more points because it means more to them. Yeah. But in this situation, it doesn't work like that because Mm. the system is screwed. So maybe they both get the same amount of points. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I love that you said, like, this person has a hundred sandwiches, hundreds of sandwiches a sure. day. Like, you just imagine someone just eating a hundred yeah, of got sandwiches a day. duffel bags full. But that's true. Yeah, it's, 
I mean, we had a little bit of that conversation with um, Vicky in season one when she was pretending to be real Eleanor. Uh, when Eleanor was trying to say, well, my parents were really awful and they got divorced. And then real Eleanor comes back with, oh, yeah, well, you know, I was abandoned at a subway station and then my adopted parents died. And then this ha-, like, mm-hmm. you know, this giant tra- tragedy after tragedy. Right. And how she overcame it just to make Eleanor feel worse. But. Yeah, we don't actually know if that makes you a better person in the eyes of the good place, so. Exactly. Yeah. What did you think of Camilla's exhibit? (laughs) Her giving out omelets? Yeah, apparently making omelets is art now. (laughs) Food can be art to honey. Jeez. (laughs) It's a look on subservience, consumption, death. And pedagogy. Yes. Which I had no idea what pedagogy was. So I looked it up. It's the method and practice of teaching Uh and uh, as an academic subject or a theoretical concept. Yeah. So that's like four things that aren't relatable whatsoever. Okay, hold on. (laughs) Conception and death. Consumption. Oh, consumption. Yeah. Okay, consuming people and things. Sure. Subservience. Subservience. So she's being the servant type Mm -hmm. person. Okay. Death. Don't really. Death, maybe animal death. I have no idea. She's, it's eggs and cheese. I have no idea. (laughs) And pedagogy. (laughs) And then teaching people about art. I have no idea. Right. I don't really get how it goes together. If we have any um, art connoisseurs art i feel like majors listening let us know the motif though (laughs) this for camilla is talking about a lot of things that sound fancy and important but at the end of the day they don't really mean a whole lot no yeah um (laughs) oh tahani mentions ben affleck's crippling addiction to back tattoos yes so i looked that up and I guess he's got a huge tattoo of a phoenix on his back. Oh, really? Like, it's a full back piece. And years and years ago, he was saying that it was for a movie and it was fake. But, <laughs> no, it's real. It's just <laughs> giant. Wow. Yeah. They must have fun airbrushing oh, my goodness. that out yeah. for movies. <laughs> have Matt Damon and Ben Affleck actually been in the same movie recently? Not recently, but they're okay. well known to be like BFFs, and that's always been the joke. Okay. Like, I mean, they wrote Goodwill Hunting together. Right. So, okay. And they were both in it, so. I just thought maybe she was commenting on Ben Affleck being in a movie with Matt Damon recently, mm. but to be honest, I don't really hear about either of them much now. I don't know. Maybe I'm just not seeking them out, and yeah. that's why. I mean, he's been in the, Ben Affleck's been in the spotlight a lot recently for Batman. Oh, yeah. Then I guess I'm just really not paying attention about Ben Affleck. And Matt Damon has been in the spotlight a lot for his works on the environment and raising awareness for uh, clean drinking water. Oh, that seems like good stuff. And his movie Downsizing, where a bunch mm. of about a bunch of people who can make themselves really small. Yeah, and um, it turned yeah. into a giant like, pardon the pun, but a giant <laughs> flop because it turned out to be just a big environmental message so Uh, like halfway through the movie completely switches tones and it was really discerning like it wasn't it wasn't what people went to the movie to go see they wanted to see a bunch of little people doing you know living in this giant world and and then it just turns into a big you know we're we're messing up with the environment and we're all gonna be screwed in 100 years right okay shall we continue When Camilla refuses Tahani's apology, Tahani begins to wreck her exhibit. While awaiting arrest, Tahani tells Chidi about her relationship with her sister. She realizes that their animosity stems from their parents constantly making them compete. Tahani embraces Camilla and the two commiserate about their awful parents and they begin the journey of reconciliation. Which we won't see. Of course not. Of course not. Okay, so... Right at the top of this part, um, Tahani says she apologizes for any of her part in their relationship. 
But I kind of don't believe that apology. No, it's it's very much a selfish apology to me. Like, like when a teacher tells you to go apologize to that kid that you just picked on. And mm-hmm. you're like, fine, I'm sorry. And you're doing it for yourself. And you're doing it for the teacher. And you're doing it for the show of it. Okay, so at this point, Tahani's doing it because Janet's told her to do it. Yeah. Okay. And she wants Camilla to accept her apology so Tahani can feel better. Right, right. So Tahani will have done the job she was supposed to do, right? Yeah. Okay. And then and then it's up to Camilla to repair the relationship. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Camilla. Uh, she kind of... I, I guess it didn't really surprise me that she didn't accept Tahani's apology, but it was like an extra slap in the face to hear mm-hmm. that. Oh, yeah, it was great. And I just, uh, the way she treats Tahani in this episode, I don't love it. I mean, there, again, she's publicly shaming her, saying, you know, well, it's my sister's fault that, fault that the exhibit is over and you aren't getting a refund. And then just like in past episodes, you know, smirking when Tahani doesn't get anything and her parents will because they wrote her name as Tahini and all of this other All these moments, you know, it's just, it's not great. It's just continuing on. And a lot of me thinks that part of that is ingrained in Camilla. Mm -hmm. Of every time Tahani doesn't get something, Camilla gets rewarded. And it's almost like a Pavlov's dog. Like, it's been ingrained in her that Tahani's failure is her gain. And Mm -hmm. she just can't help but have these reactions. So... I don't know how much of it is actually Camilla's fault because she's been affected as much as Tahani has. They both grew up in the same situation, but she was treated much better. Yeah, I guess I just feel like they're retconning a lot of Camilla and Tahani's relationship in this episode, personally. Like, in their flashback, or in Tahani's flashback, she sees, you know, her parents pitting them against each other. Mm-hmm. But in a lot of the flashbacks we saw prior to this one, it was always Camilla being praised and doted on and Tahani being either ignored or uh, passive-aggressively ripped apart. Um, like, back in season one, when we see Tahani and Camilla showcasing their statues of uh of a bird and Mm -hmm. and and camilla's being praised for how you know interesting her art is whereas tahani's is sort of like oh that's nice honey um and when tahani hasn't raised as much money as camilla has and she says she it's a disappointment now right Mm -hmm. um and her parents offering to spend millions of dollars just to have lunch with their own daughter that kind of thing like I don't feel like it's entirely accurate. I feel like we kind of came up with that to make Camilla more sympathetic. But I guess, you know, Hmm. also having that constant praise and then having that followed immediately by Tahani being ripped apart by her parents. Like you said, this kind of Pavlov's dog thing, like it's just ingrained into her that her success only comes at the price of Tahani being belittled or Mm -hmm. whatever else. Devalued. Right. So I don't feel like that removes all responsibility from her. Oh, absolutely not. Because it's not like... She's still a person and can control of her actions. Yeah, exactly. You're still a person you could still have learned, especially once you moved away from your parents and you moved out of their home and away from Tahani. Like, would and they you died. not have? Yeah, would you not have grown a little and started to realize that your actions are not great? <laughs> I think, like Tahani, she loves her success. Yeah, and she, she loves, loves people doting yeah. on her. She loves the attention. Yes, you know. I just, I I saw that a lot of fans were really unhappy with um, how the show seemed to be rewriting Tahani's history. And I had to agree. I wasn't, it just didn't sit right with me, I guess. Hmm. Um, I feel like maybe we could have got a little bit of a different tone in some earlier episodes that would have hinted toward that or something. But 
I don't know. I didn't see that. Yeah. And I guess I sort of feel like, well, should Camilla be forgiven for her part in their relationship together? Because it just suggests that that flashback just suggests that she's not responsible just because her parents are wankers. Like just because your parents are jerks doesn't make it okay for you to also be a jerk, right? I just, I feel like that's the message that was given. Like when Tahani comes up to Camilla and says, I'm so sorry, our parents always did this to us and it's not fair and it's not right. And the only response from Camilla is, yeah, our parents were wankers. And there's a nice moment where Tahani touches her face and there's a little bit of misty eyes. And and I do feel something there. I feel like there's a possibility of reconciliation. I just feel like, you know, it's not like Camilla is some sort of perfect, amazing person now. No, I think in this situation, I feel like Tahani is the victor in this competition. Mm. In this forgiveness competition. Ooh, my goodness. Well, she, she's the one that she takes the, the high road, I guess, mm. and acknowledges how it affected both of them and how horribly they've been treated. Mm-hmm. But see, I always imagined, I always saw them being treated horribly. I never saw, I didn't feel like they were retconning their history. Because okay. I always saw that. To me, it always seemed like Tahani and Camilla were pitted against each other by their parents. Being oh. manipulated. I Yeah, I guess I just didn't see the the very stark um, competition where it's like, here you go, you're both given a thing to do, do that thing, and then we're going to decide who's best at it. It well, was more of a... I think that was very purposeful just for this episode so they could we could actually see... The representation of the two heads together and the two kids apart mm. just so we would get a idea based on all the paintings that we saw and so it would all make sense visually mm-hmm. and i think that was just one example and i'm sure in season one when they were having their their birds that was their parents as well like we want you to create make uh, a work of art based on a bird go no yeah Okay. I definitely see that now. Because I'm thinking about Camilla's artwork, which isn't my thing. Mm -hmm. But it's, I guess it's, I don't, I see it less as a competition and more of a, their parents kept them apart kind of thing. Almost in a purposeful way, Mm -hmm. kept them from being close to each other because they made Camilla and Tahani ask for attention all the time and then only give it to one of them, right? So it's like they couldn't really be a team. Mm -hmm. Camilla and Tahani couldn't. They couldn't be sisters like they should have been. Right. Yeah. Okay. And the parents were forging this successful family Mm -hmm. based on, you know, animosity. So they were building up... Camilla to be this successful artist and give her all sorts of praise. I mean, she was super talented. Mm-hmm. So was Tahani. But they also created a successful person in Tahani for the wrong reasons because she was constantly competing with Camilla. So they, the parents created these two giant successful people. Mm-hmm. But then created this really toxic relationship. Absolutely. Between them. Yeah. Or fueled it, at least. And the parents, I don't know whether they cared. (laughs) It doesn't seem like the parents cared whatsoever, obviously, because if they did, they wouldn't have done it. They must be in the bad place. Right. You don't treat your children like that. Well, they're not dead yet. They're in their cryogenic chambers. Oh, that's true. They're frozen. That's true. But they're dead. Your soul, well, like your soul, I don't know. They're just sleeping. Yeah. It's like they're in a coma. Oh, come on. Tahani even admits to Chidi when they're sitting together chatting. That her parents' standards were incredibly high and impossible to please. Mm -hmm. And yet, she continuously tried to. She She, tried over and over and over again because they're her parents. It's interesting to hear Tahani say that even her parents wouldn't be impressed by Camilla now. Mm -hmm. Like, 
oh yeah, they wouldn't really care that she has an entire wing of a museum dedicated. No, they'd to why her. not? Why not the whole museum? Yeah, why not the whole, why not every museum on the planet? Yeah, you know, um, that's this interesting. is great. Just why not better? Because we haven't seen Tahani's parents be disappointed in Camilla. And this was another big turning point for Tahani because her apology to her sister, her real apology, mm. was for her sister. It wasn't for herself. It wasn't for anyone else. It was, I'm sorry you had to go through this. I'm sorry we had to go through this. Mm -hmm. I can see how it affected your art and you doing this your entire life. It's fueled your, this animosity between us has fueled your creative decisions. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was the big point for me. For Tahani. Yeah, plus also probably this like feuding sisterhood has most likely given them some... See, this is why I like doing this podcast is because I can come in with this like very straight opinion, like very like, nope, I didn't like this and here's why and it didn't work for me and all this and then we can talk it out and I can start seeing a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And I like that. It's it's nice to actually be able to talk some of this stuff out. If you had more friends who would be willing to chat about tv shows <laughs> but it's okay we have our online friends yes we do i just wanted to quickly go over the description of camilla's art exhibit oh because okay. i thought it was kind of entertaining the persistence of conception a reverie is a work that explores the relationship between gender politics copycat violence and the protective shells we find ourselves in as we grow mature and search for meaning with influences as diverse as caravaggio who is an italian painter Francis Bacon, who is an English philosopher, statesman, scientist, jurist, orator, and author, and he served both as the Attorney General and Lord Chancellor of England. Mm -hmm. And Miles Davis, who is an American jazz trumpeter, band leader, and composer. The new variations are distilled from both mundane and transcendent structures. Ever since she was a young woman, Camilla has been fascinated by the unrelenting divergence of the moment. What starts out as hope soon becomes corroded into a carnival of lust, leaving only a sense of failing and the unlikelihood of a new beginning or a satisfying ending. As momentary replicas become distorted through diligent and repetitive practice, the viewer asks, which came first, Camilla or her art? Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, so that sounds incredibly pretentious. And oh, all absolutely. I can think of is Dave saying, well, that's a fun way to say a normal thing. <laughs> like, ugh. It's just Sometimes saying it's... a lot, but not. Yeah, but what anything. are you saying? Yeah. Um. <laughs> so it it'd be kind of interesting. Uh... I didn't really feel like going through each of those sentences and kind of pulling it apart and dissecting it, but it sounds extremely pretentious and a whole lot of nothing. And I like how it's all all this text is in the shape of an egg. Mm -hmm. So it's a great you know which came first the. Camilla or the art or the chicken and the egg and I mean don't get me wrong I love I love art I find um you know interpretation of art very interesting um but there are sometimes a point where it's you're really just tooting your own horn you know oh, absolutely it's a bit much Eleanor is determined to prove that her mother is running a scam after confronting Dave and realizing he already knows about her mother's secret Eleanor breaks down She's heard that her mother is capable of change, but didn't change for her. Eleanor discovers that her mother is hiding a stash of money, but she convinces Donna to accept her new life and use that money to be a good parent. As Eleanor and Michael are on their way out of town, he reveals to Eleanor that she and Chidi were in love in the afterlife. Okay, so hmm. reel it all the way back. Eleanor thinks her mom is running a scam. Of course she does. That's the only thing that Eleanor has ever known of her mother. Why would she think differently? She needs her mom to be running a scam. Well, yeah. She needs her mom to be the same person for her not to crumble. Yeah. I was surprised that Dave already knew. I really love his line of, well, she's making me kind of a badass. I mean, who am I? Avril Lavigne? Right? It, like, it's, it's funny. It's ridiculous it's like an apple watch with some studs on it yeah exactly it reminds me of like some stuff i definitely wore back in ninth grade <laughs> um but you know i i expected this reaction from eleanor so like the first time i watched it when she started 
to cry and say, you know, that's the mom that I wanted, it kind of didn't have the effect that I thought it would. I didn't feel that bad. Because you saw it coming. Oh, from a mile away. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, Yeah, it was very different from when she was in the department store and she was looking for the toothbrushes and the toothbrush holder. And the guy mm -hmm. was like, yeah, it's for a whole family toothbrush. Mm -hmm. And that scene was totally impactful because you didn't see that coming at all mm -hmm. it was a surprise but the, the, yeah this whole episode is leading up to that moment that revelation you're just waiting for it exactly not to say that it isn't earned from eleanor i mean it makes complete sense that she would have that reaction and it is a good thing eleanor is more honest with her emotions now even if it is not with her mom at least she's being honest with michael before mm -hmm. she was just holding it all in until she sees something like a toothbrush holder with four toothbrushes right so i guess that's growth in a way for eleanor i do wish that she had actually said those words to her mom though yes that would have been good. really good that would have been impactful to actually have her say you know you are obviously capable of change you started to change before i even came here today but you never felt obligated to change for me. Like I wasn't worth changing for. And that hurts. Mm -hmm. And I would have liked a scene where she actually got to tell her mom that and not tell Michael that. And maybe see her mom have an emotional reaction to that. Yeah. That would have shown a lot of growth as well. Yeah. Eleanor keeps saying she doesn't know anything about kids. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because she never really got a chance to be a kid. <sighs> Jason, why do you got to say things that make me sad? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's got to be true. By the time she was nine years old, she was probably just taking care of herself all the time. Yeah. We already know she had a job at 14 and moved out around that time. I really liked Michael's stern but caring dad talk. Mm. Like, you were going to go to that PTA meeting and I don't want to hear another word about it. And Eleanor says, no, that doesn't work at all. But I mm. think it did. I think it worked really well. And Eleanor doesn't think it worked because she never had that. She never had a stern but caring dad to mm -hmm. give her that kind of talk. I mean, I didn't either. I grew up with just my mom. But it seemed like something that a father or a parental figure would say. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very effective. Yeah, so. I'm pretty sure my dad said something along those lines at some point in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, cut it out. I don't want to hear an another word. Just go and do the thing. So, <laughs> sorry, Eleanor, but it was effective. Yeah. You're wrong. <laughs> also, Michael calls her Doc McStuffins when she's about to slash open the stuffed animal. <laughs> That's an actual Disney TV show. It's an animated series about a little seven-year-old girl who wants to become a doctor just like her mom. And Aww. so she practices on her toys. Oh, Yeah. That's cute. <laughs> also, the tagline for the MGM Grand School is always bet on Reed mm. instead of always bet on Red. Well, Red and Reed are written the same way. Yes. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I thought it was good. I actually thought that it said always left on Red at first. And I was like, <laughs> like. <laughs> like turning? Like texts. No, I was thinking like, oh, she left me on red. Have you ever heard that expression? No. Okay. So certain phones have red receipts for text. So you can tell when a person has received the message that you've sent them. Like Facebook Messenger or something. Yeah, exactly. There'll be like a little check mark or a little something, right? So you can see when someone's read your message, but has chosen for whatever reason not to reply to it. Like, uh. Uh, she left me on red. So I guess she's not interested. Okay. That kind of thing. I thought that's what it said, and I was like, oh, I don't really get how that relates to Nevada, but sure, whatever. Shout out to Garrett, by the way, who actually lives in Las Vegas, who may or may not have enjoyed some of the jokes in this episode about how much Nevada is a mess. <laughs> oh, apparently, you have a lot of hooters out there, so. But some the fancy looking ones. Yeah, yeah, the fancy looking hooters, you know, like, looks like a bank. So, what I wish would have happened in this scene is I wish that Donna would have apologized to Eleanor for not being a better mother to her. I think that it's really great that she's trying to be the best that she can for Patricia. But of course, as Eleanor mentions later, that doesn't erase anything that she did to her daughter. And I feel like that's a bit of a frustrating message in this episode because I feel like we should be saying that 
moving forward doesn't erase your past mistakes, uh, but also your past mistakes doesn't negate your process, your progress. But I feel like we should be saying that people need to be willing to own up to their mistakes and try to make amends on their behalf. Like Mm -hmm. Donna should have been the one to try to make amends instead of Eleanor in this episode. Um, I think it would have been really powerful for Eleanor to see that growth in her mother and it might have encouraged her to continue on her path as well. However, it might have been a little too out of character. Um, But I guess I kind of think of it as like Alcoholics Anonymous, like the 12 steps and one of those steps being making amends with people and actually sitting down with them and saying, I'm sorry for, you know, past mistake and I will do better in the future, and I'm sorry that I hurt you, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe Donna could have been going through Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's how they could have made it work. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think there could have been a more fulfilling way to do this episode, but maybe that's just personal to me. I feel a little better now about Tani and Camilla. Still feel pretty much the same about Eleanor and Donna, though. Yeah, it's seeing Patricia is just like a replacement for Eleanor. Like I screwed up my first kid. I got to do right the second time around with somebody else's kid. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's probably relatable for a lot of people out there. So I'm looking forward to the next episode when we get to see a little bit more about Chidi and Eleanor. uh, Now that Eleanor knows about the two of them. Yeah. I mean, I I wonder if it's going to be similar to last season where she finds out, but doesn't say anything for a long time. I really hope not. I just want them to address it. I think that will be treading the same territory. Mm -hmm. It it, it would just get boring, I think. So I'm hoping they do something different. Yes. Um, But I'm looking forward to it. I have missed their connection this season. Well, Chidi was with Simone, so... Yes, of course. I don't know whether... I mean, I doubt Eleanor even looked as cheaty as a potential relationship at any point yeah because of simone because of their more academic friend relationship Mm -hmm. yeah all right so is there anything in this episode that you feel like we should touch on before we get to our mailbag um how much michael really liked that margarita (laughs) yes and he's not even a tequila guy he was like swirling his finger in it just trying to get every last drop oh that was good i kind of want to see michael drunk oh me too be really interesting yes i mean (laughs) we saw him kind of like drunk on dread Mm -hmm. in season two which like drunk on dread yeah that sounds good no it doesn't (laughs) um and i really like how much he bonded with dave yes they became like bffs architect pals yeah and uh and Michael's little comment about, oh, yeah, totally. I know how to use a bathroom. I love going in there and just shoving one out, you know? It's great. Sitting uh, on that thing. Yeah, which is, I, I guess we can take that as canon that demons definitely don't poop. No, they don't use the bathroom. Yeah, they don't. I also liked Camilla's moment with Cheaty. I thought it was funny. You know, All your fears are mine. <laughs> plus, she's just there. She is, you know, being almost effortlessly alluring and Mm. mysterious so i like that she was drawn right in oh yeah he's like she's amazing all of my fears are hers now (laughs) and then i love his reaction as soon as tahani break tahani smashes down with the axe and he's like oh no my fears are mine now yeah my fears are mine again it's good we didn't get a whole lot of jason in this episode no um and not a whole lot of janet either Mm -hmm. just a little bit it's nice to see janet driving a car i guess but they definitely weren't the stars of this episode no yeah so based on what i said last week about not really enjoying where the season's going Mm -hmm. i still feel the same everything was wrapped up way too quickly um all these these huge issues that have been ginormous in the upbringing and the developing of these characters, Camilla and her sister and Eleanor and her parents and her mom, like they're a huge part of who these people are. And then having all of this conflict wrapped up in one episode just seems wrong. Mm-hmm. But I understand it's, it's, 
it's a show it's a tv show it's literally for our entertainment there is a lot of depth to it mm-hmm. but they do have limits in time and the amount of episodes so i get it and i'm not too upset with the writers the writers and michael sure like i i get it i get why it has to happen i'm not too happy about it but i understand it yeah i did ask on twitter how people felt about camilla and tahani and eleanor and donna and pretty much everybody said that it it felt too easy so yeah it seems to be kind of a common feeling that seems to be how each episode has been in this in this this season season so far like they introduce conflict and then wrap it up introduce conflict wrap it up right just over and over again so we don't get that nice slow burn conflict right right okay that's fair at the very end when eleanor says she never told anyone she loved him and then you see michael like right before he tells her they go over a bump in the road Mm. so i thought that was very on the nose like (laughs) oh this is another little hiccup that i need to bring up (laughs) it's like a literal bump in the road for them for michael to to talk about oh cute i didn't think about that (laughs) all right so shall we get to our mailbag sure okay mail mailbag by camilla exploring the art of communication and how much do we communicate in this world and what even is talking it's just making word sounds with your mouth holes not to honey (laughs) that's our introduction that's mail yeah okay so our first piece of mail comes from ben connors he said i do agree with jason this season has felt aimless as though it's searching for a point Season 2 felt this way for a while, but it got together a lot sooner. By episode 4 of season 2, the plot of everyone getting to the real good place and then teaming up with Michael was established. We're more than halfway through season 3, and it seems like we're moving nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're in... uh, Wow, we're in episode 7, and we don't exactly have an end point for this season in mind. We don't know what the overall plot really is yeah i mean the idea is to help other people get to the good place but that was established literally two episodes ago yeah we're meandering more this season yes ben continues on to say another problem that i have is that i don't like how the conflicts this season have been solved by the end of the episode just like you mentioned right we just talked about that yeah uh the good place always felt like a step above other comedies sorry Above other sitcoms because it didn't go for the easy fix. And in season three, it feels like it's starting to. Tahani and her sister, Eleanor and her mother, could have been fascinating stories if they were carried out over multiple episodes and fleshed out. Instead, they're all wrapping it up in a neat little bow after 20 minutes. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I just, all I have to say to that is yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you, Ben. Absolutely. Um, And then he goes on to disappoint me. Uh, sorry to disappoint Vivian, but I'm starting to lose faith and interest in Chidi and Eleanor. I don't think I've been this hit over the head with a pairing since Chuck and Blair and Gossip Girl. The difference is this is a pairing I'd like. Through the videotape and Michael Mm -hmm. revealing their past love to Eleanor, it all feels very artificial. They fall in love because they were once and feel like they should be again, rather than anything that grows naturally from their character arcs or what they want at the moment. Yeah. Um, I mean, I... I still love Chidi and Eleanor. I still love who they are as individuals, who they are together, that they make each other better, uh, that they complement each other very well. But it is sort of becoming a theme. I think if they had just had it in season two, where Eleanor found out through the videotape, maybe fine. Okay, we did it once that time. But happening again, I'm just... I think I'm going to have to decide sort of how I feel when I see next episode and see how they actually deal with that this season. Mm -hmm. I'm not losing faith or interest in them. I sort of see them on like as a pause right now. But I feel like it's valid to say that um, that it sort of feels a little bit forced, like where you keep putting them back together just because they were once together. Right. Our next piece of mail comes from Sierra at Callus Strange. 
Listening to the end of Chidi's Moral Muscles, I'm curious about your solution to basically just turning everyone into an existentialist. Maybe everyone would react like Angel. If nothing we do matters, then all that matters is what we do. And try to help people. Maybe the knowledge that no one is going to go to the good place would make people not care. Maybe the solution is to tell everyone they're the only one who knows about the afterlife, so they think they can save everyone else around them. <laughs> Uh, it's interesting because like what if this is part of Michael's plan like what if part of Michael's plan is that he tells them about the afterlife and you know now they actually start to do real good things out in the world like I doubt it I really doubt it I feel like that wouldn't track at all no because that would be a good plan and Michael doesn't have good plans yeah okay (laughs) um (laughs) <laughs> but uh, I really like the comparison to Angel. Um, just this idea of if nothing we do matters, if it's not actually being calculated, or if nothing we do matters because we're going to go to the bad place anyway, then all that matters is what we do on this earth. Right. I'm... And all that matters is the effect we have on the people around us. So I really like that comparison. I think it's really interesting. I'm sure that there would be hundreds of thousands of people who would just look at that situation and be like oh well i guess i better be a horrible person for the rest of my life because nothing matters yeah like oh it's a perfect opportunity to be a total douche nozzle right but i think that would be a minority of people i would hope that it would be a minority of people i don't know there's a really a lot of terrible people out there (laughs) well what would you do i think i would just continue on with life as it is i don't at this point in my life i don't have um any guarantee or any real faith that there's going to be anything after this and I'm kind of just okay with that like if this is the life that I have then this is the life that I have and I'm no, gonna but do what if someone told you that there was an afterlife but you wouldn't be able to get into it I still wouldn't be okay seeing people hurt by mm-hmm. my actions I still wouldn't want to hurt other people right um just because you don't have a chance to get in doesn't mean other people can't yeah I so. just I have a really hard time making other people feel sad. (laughs) And I don't like doing it. This is true. You are a good person. (laughs) Yeah, I guess. All right. And um, our last piece here is not actually um, something that was submitted to us, but something that I saw on Reddit, actually, that I liked. Um, It gave me a bit of a different perspective on this episode. And maybe it'll be appreciated by some of our listeners here. Um, User Wheatley67 said, I've noticed that each of these saved a loved one arcs gives an example of different aspects of helping others change for the better. Donkey Doug showed us that some people just don't want to change, but you can still have an effect on them. Pillboy showed us that some people are really good, but just need a little bit of direction. Donna shows us that some people are capable of change, and while the damage they've done in the past can never truly be undone, they're not beyond hope. And Camilla shows us that all the attention and the praise in the world can't make up for your own insecurities, and sometimes that's the root cause of bad behavior. Hmm, interesting. So I like that. It's nice that every person we've... It's nice that every person that the Soul Squad has focused on so far has a different journey on that saved path, right? Mm -hmm. Not everyone is the same. It's not the exact same story over and over again. So It's like our main characters. Yeah. Each one is in the bad place for different reasons. Yeah, and each one is changing to a little extent, a bigger extent, whatever, in different ways. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, for your mail. We did have a few other submissions, but they were mainly about things that we had already talked about this episode. So if we didn't mention you, we still got your letter and we appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. We still appreciate it. So that brings us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. And it's the best way to save us from eternal damnation. (laughs) I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) If you want to get in touch with us, we are on Twitter at Multiverse Radio, and we are on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can always email us from our website, www.multiverseradio.ca. We'll talk to you next week. Bye. Bye. Who am I, Avril Levine? Like, 
That was Avril Levine. Well, Avril Levine, whatever. Avril, Avril. Shush. <laughs> It's like someone pronouncing your name Vivian. Oh and my you'd god. Be like, oh, it's fine. Okay, fine. I'll say the part again. Who am I? Avril Levine? That's how you say it. Avril, not. Okay, okay. <laughs>